I'm going to start now. Um, my name's Andy Doan, and this is Ricardo Salvetti. Uh, we work at uh, Foundries.io, where we help device makers secure IoT and edge devices to market faster. And then we kind of help them manage uh, through the lifetime of their product. So uh, before I begin, I'm going to call out a couple names. Hold your hand up if I say your name. Uh, is Bruce Schneier here? Uh, Daniel Bernstein? All right, so if you're not holding your hand up right now, you're in a group of people where we probably shouldn't be in grip, uh, inventing crypto or our own security ideas. So that's what this talks about today. How can you know, kind of ordinary people start to handle sensitive information on embedded devices? Uh, this kind of goes through a lot of different topics. So feel free to just interrupt, raise your hand if you've got questions. It may be kind of hard to have the context later on if you wait till the very end. So um, anyways, we're, we're happy to answer while, we get, uh, while we're going. So uh, the presentation is kind of one of those classic memes on the internet, the how it started, how it's going. We had a customer that had what I thought was a relatively simple question about how they wanted to interact with a big cloud service securely. And the support question kind of, well, I kind of looked around and asked a support ticket, and they kind of come back. Well, you just need, you know, unencrypted credential file on a device to, to work with this. Now, to be, to be fair, I wasn't talking to their A-plus tech support team, so maybe there was a better thing. But I, I thought it was kind of a more industry-wide thing. This tends to be how things boil down to. And it kind of drove me nuts. I, I think there's better ways that we need to do this, and I mean, that's the mission of our company is to do these things better. So that's where uh, we've landed on having this talk. Just before we get going on this, you know, some people may be like, well, what's the big deal about putting sensitive information on devices? And I've, I don't know. I'm going to claim this is my own law of internet security. I'm kind of crazy like that and hyperbolic. But my bigger point is credentials always get leaked. And like sometimes you think you're doing something clever or you've got some idea of how you're going to make your device secure. There's just guys out there like Matthew Garrett who are going to see your device, and after a couple of days, they're going to find that UART you hid, or they're going to hook an oscilloscope up and start pulling keys off your TPM or something. So if you don't do these things the right way, you're just at risk. And I, some of these security talks kind of get bad. It's all like doom and gloom, and you know we're all going to die. I, I will say on a positive note, I think our industry, we, we have a superpower. It's like our how hard could it be mindset, or you know, in Texan, here, hold my beer. Um, and that mindset's done us really well. You get individuals that create some open source project on GitHub, and they'll topple an entire proprietary software company. You know, we've done really neat things. It made us naive enough to create a startup company. <laughs> so uh, we do these. And then we created a startup company, and I was like, Man, I don't like Jenkins. I'm going to create a better open source version of it. And I mean, today, that's still like a backbone of our company. But when you start talking about security, it is hard. And that how hard could it be mindset starts to fail us. Um, security is necessarily complicated. You, um, you can't really simplify it. You can kind of streamline security, but you've got to do it right. Um, a common thing, I, I work on uh, software uh, over-the-air update stuff on the client server side. So I tend to bump into people that have ideas for, oh, here's how you could do a secure OTA. And I kind of love pointing them at like the tough specification and all the things that they've gone through that you have to do to make an update like reliable and secure. The point being, unless you're like a small handful of experts, your attempt at customer security is probably going to fail. So then, how are we going to do this? <laughs> I kind of hit a problem every time when you start talking about security is it means different things to different people. So there's a lot of layers to security, and there's different dimensions to it. And a lot of times, I see people in meetings, and they're trying to talk about security, and they're kind of talking by each other. Because you might have a hardware guy, and like his view of security is just like, well, I'm, I'm building this HSM, and it supports these elliptical curve algorithms. Or you, know, you talk to the ops guy, and he's worried about like 
how TLS is secure between the device and the cloud. And then maybe you get like more probably the people in this room, maybe you're more interested in the firmware stuff and you're talking about, ah, what are the keys for signing the bootloader and the operating system? But he's talking to the DevOps guy who's talking about keys for talking to TLS. So all of a sudden these words like keys and security can get a little bit confusing for everyone. So um, I'm gonna kind of present some building blocks here. Uh, this is possibly my worst slide. That's why I kind of put this silly picture of Nick Jonas up there. there. There's some people that are gonna be like, ah, this slide is completely obvious, you know. Of course, and then there's gonna be some people here that are like, whoa, this is too much information. So for the people that think, ah, this is a little bit boring, of course I know it, I'll, I'll give my sports analogy. Professional baseball players hit off a tee every day. So every now and then as like professionals, we gotta look at some building blocks. So just to get us all level set here, I think the first like big building block when we're talking about security is public key uh, infrastructure, PKI. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. You can kind of see my snarky comments, X509 and uh, ASN1. But the good thing about uh, PKI is this has been scrutinized and looked over for a long time, and the stuff works. So uh, to explain PKI just really high, I'll get into it a little more in a second. This is how we're going to establish trust between different entities, say devices and the cloud trusting one another. And once you have your PKI in place, and you've got these credentials, you can start doing some neat stuff, like encrypting things. Most people tend to, I think, people will start with symmetric encryption. You know, both people share a key, and you can encrypt and decrypt with it, which is okay, but then you get into some cool stuff asymmetric, which we'll talk about. And then maybe even more kind of primitive to PKI is this notion of signing things. So, you can prove that you're the person that possesses a private key. And so we're talking about all these keys and all this stuff here. All of a sudden, where that key lives becomes critical to your product. So this is where the HSMs come in. Um, they're able to keep a key in a way that no one else is gonna be able to see it. And then when you put all that stuff together, you make Nick Jonas happy with his chef kiss. So, Here's a PKI at kind of a high level. You start with this root certificate authority. And this is again, as I start talking about this, people tend to, we're talking about keys and certificates, they come together in what we call a key pair. Now your root key pair is gonna be a private key, it's gonna be some certificate that's signed with it, and it's gonna have some metadata that, you know, maybe says when it was created, how long it's gonna be valid, things like that. Because this is the root to everything you have, this key becomes essentially too big to fail. And I would say there's very few people whose like levels of paranoia aren't justified for protecting this key. Because this key is so important, you can't like keep it around on computers and stuff. So you have to create what we call intermediate certificate authorities. These intermediate certificate authorities, they've got a private key and they have a certificate. And inside that certificate, you can see, hey, that was signed by the root certificate. And that CA may have this uh, ability to create other keys for people. Now we're talking about these certificates. The way these certificates start to get created and traded around is using these certificate signing requests. So the certificate signing request is a pretty simple thing. Like, a device can say, hey, you know, I need a certificate. Here's some metadata I'm hoping you'll put in it. Here's my, uh, the public side of my private key. And that intermediate CA can look at it and say, yeah, I like what you want. I'll sign that. And the certificate, these things are okay to share around in the public. Because the way that certificate works is, is you do operations. The only way that you, there's a ways that you can verify that person possesses the private key of that certificate. And some other interesting things like with these certificates you can start to do is, say in that metadata, you kind of have a, a, a field in your X509 that says like who the owner of it is. You can start putting some things like say the device's UUID in there. And now suddenly a device 
is cryptographically pinned to that name. So as he tries to access things on the web and says, hey, I'm, I'm Bob, you say, no, no, actually, you're cryptographically you know, Alice or something. Once we, oops, sorry. Once we get a PKI set up, really the first place that we start seeing this used for um, embedded devices is with mutual TLS. So you've got this key infrastructure. Essentially, everyone in your infrastructure knows who the root is. So then MTLS is a great way for clients and servers to talk to one another. So a client can talk to the server and say, hey, I want to talk to you. Who are you? And that server can say, hey, I'm this guy. I've got this TLS cert. And he can do some cool things with his private key to say, yeah, yeah, this is my cert. And the device can say, OK, you've got a valid cert, and it was signed by the root that I trust, so let's talk. But then the server's like, oh, hey, but who are you? And the device is like, oh, here's my cert. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's right. And I trust your root, so we're good to go. We can talk. And the nice thing when we're doing embedded development, these uh, uh, mutual TLS is essentially widely adopted. Everyone has it, especially like these big cloud providers. So like Amazon, Azure, Google, they all have things usually called like an API gateway. And you can give that a API gateway your root cert, and then it can create a TLS cert, give you the request, sorry, it'll give you a certificate signing request, you sign it, and then their API gateway can start handling TLS traffic for you that you've authorized. So they've, you've never seen their private key, they've never seen your private key, but all of a sudden you've got this trust. And then if it knows that root, device gets, devices can just start you know, magically talking into their services and trust them. The next thing that we tend to talk about, and this is where you know, kind of the, the talk started with, was um, encrypting content. So symmetric encryption, it's not bad, and a lot of times you need it, but the, the thing that always makes me uncomfortable with symmetric encryption is <laughs> there's a lot of people sharing this thing that becomes super powerful. So some really smart math guys came up with some other techniques for encryption called asymmetric. And this is pretty basic. You, with, if you know someone's public key, you can encrypt data in a way that only the person that uh, possesses that private key can decrypt it. So this is pretty handy. Like, this is something I like when, when our own customers are wanting to give us like sensitive configuration for their devices. They can give it to us, and I don't know the content of it. And if something bad happens, they don't have to worry. You don't have to trust the person that's hosting it for your devices. Only that device is going to be able to do it. Now just a, a little kind of pro tip on the bottom. This may be obvious to some people, but usually you're going to need to kind of keep that config data on the device stored perfectly. Uh, persistently. So keep the encrypted one stored wherever you want on disk, but when you decrypt that thing, because a lot of services are still going to want to read a file from disk, put that in tempfs. That way when you reboot the thing, it's gone, or when someone's just trying to analyze it, you know, when it's powered off, you're always safe. And then here's something, as you start doing things the right way, you're going to bump into this thing called ECIES. So, Asymmetric, asymmetric encryption for RSA, it's pretty well-known, well-supported, common way. And if you're doing encrypting like certain sizes of payloads, it's just slam dunk easy. The bigger ones, there's a couple of ways to do it, but it's pretty much a set in stone thing. Everyone does that pretty well. Elliptical curve is a little bit less so. And the thing is, you need to be using elliptical curves for all your encryption these days. It's a, it's a better way. RSA is not so great anymore. So the problem is how do we start doing encryption with elliptical, elliptical curves, because it's different than the RSA technique. So the standard has emerged called ECIES. And I don't want to go on a, like a standard ramp, but this is one of those standards where it's a standard, but they're not interoperable with one another. But they're doing things in a way you can kind of trust. So like, the experience I had in our product, we have this like command line tool called PyOctal, and it's written in Golang, so I was trying to find a way to, to do this ECIES encryption in Golang. And the first place at the time was Ethereum was doing this, and they have a small library in their overall Ethereum project. So we were using that, it works great. But I do get like 
GitHub warnings on my repo all the time. Oh, there's a security issue in Ethereum. You've got to update your version. And you start looking around, and it's not the encryption stuff that, that we're interested in. The problem is, like, there's now an ECIS Go library that showed up afterwards. Um, it works fine, but it's not interoperable with the way we do it. So, like, all of our devices that have this uh, uh, encrypted payload that I can't now decrypt, we can only decrypt it with the Ethereum implementation. So, you know, it's just kind of a heads up as you start, you know, going down your own en encryption journey. And now we'll get into HSMs. These things are really cool. Essentially, it's some magic piece of hardware where a private key is on it if done correctly. And, you know, the mathematicians have done really neat things and it all works. And with the HSMs, the the ones that we kind of like, and the, or more or less, I, I think everyone does this, they'll support some uh, common libraries. And, like the main one that always interests me is called PKCS11. And this is a, a library that kind of exposes some simple crypto stuff, like sign this piece of data, things like that. And once you have PKCS11 in, it's such a standard, things like OpenSSL know how to use that as an engine. And if you're using OpenSSL, open now you can use curl. So you've enabled your entire ecosystem um, through this. And all of a sudden, your device with this HSM with a private key that only exists inside this piece of hardware can talk to anything in the world in a secure way. So now I'm going to hand it over to Ricardo to kind of give you guys the bad news about all this. So hello. Uh, so yeah, what I wanted to kind of cover is, you know, like, um, is when looking more on uh, on the embedded side, you know, like uh, you know, like as Andy was saying, you know, like you have the PKI and you're using asymmetric keys and you have all of that, you're using you know like the best practices. But and even with HSM, like unfortunately, you know, like life is not that easy, you know, like because it's hard enough when you're already there. So um, it's simple because you know like for security, uh, it's only really strong as your weakest link. So you might have like HSMs, you might have a lot of protection, but you know like you, if you let like an open door in there, people can explore that, and from that on, you basically lose uh, you know like uh, lose access to, to to whatever that you're trying to protect. Um, and uh, this is also like something as like Lena said on, on the keynote, and when they're talking about security in the kernel is you know like the only way to do security right is to have multiple layers of security right because in case you have an issue with one of the layers there's always additional layers to be protected right so for example using hsm is is good in that sense uh, is one uh, one layer but there's also you know like additional things that we can do on the platform side on the open embedded uh, on the on the embedded side of things and you know, like if you see on um, just security in general, embedded Linux, you know, like if for you guys that are around uh, for several years and have been working with products like for like more than you know, like embedded related products for more than fifteen years, is that security is not taken you know like seriously, you know, like at all. I mean, most of the times, and it's it's just really bad. It's not something you know, like as we've seen on these conferences. Uh, you know, the cloud is pushing ahead and, and trying to be, you know, like uh, more protective and, you know, like having new methodologies and so on and so forth. And we are kind of, you know, like delaying that, the adoption on the embedded side of things. And, you know, like you can, um, like, it's pretty common for you, like, to see, like, devices, for example, that are using root uh, by default, you know, like exposed in UART, data tag being exposed, things not signed, and, you know, like uh, SSH running by default and services exposing ports and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty pretty bad overall. Like, of course, like we're improving and are trying to improve and the idea of this presentation is to kind of show some lines of the things that it should be concerned with. But yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, and then like looking at, you know, like the, uh, the platform and the DOS uh, side of things, you know, things that you should be concerned as well, like additional layers uh, that, you, that you should be concerned with, like on the, your final implementation. There's some that are pretty uh, like simple. For example, you know, like making sure that I have secure boot in the sense that you know, like uh, the hardware is only capable of like booting images that is signed. It, you know, like with your, for example, a key with the you know, like the product owner key. Uh, that is one kind of protection. Uh, you know, like the the other thing that I can do as well is like measured boot. You can measure. You know, like after you booted, the only thing that you know is that uh, it booted a valid image, but you don't know if it was compromised or not. So there's ways you know that you can measure the boot. And with the measured data, 
uh, you can even, like, for example, perform remote attestation. That is something nice that, for example, what you could do is that you have secure boot, you have, you know, like a bunch of things that you added in there. And if the device is trying to reach, for example, a, a remote server, you can ask the device to attestate itself. Like, all right, so show me, you know, like what is actually running. And if it is not matching with, you know, like what would be expected, you can block the device, you can disable the device. So you add a new kind of layer. Even though, you know, like you might have HSMs and so on, like the key might not be, you know, like might be able to, to extract the key, but someone can still sign if it has control of the element. You know, like one other basic thing, you know, disk encryption is something also that is not that common, unfortunately. Like, if, you know, like you see like a, a, a bunch of devices out there, like it's pretty easy to extract content from the MMC and so on. So there's also a new level of protection that you can do. You can also attach, for example, like, of course, like with this, this encryption and any sort of like encryption that you have, you need, of course, to control the key. Uh, there's ways to bind the key like into like a secure boot and or like whatever secure element that you have in there so you don't actually leave that key as well. So that's another good thing to do. Uh, in just general hardening and surface, you know, like attack reduction, uh, of course, like, you know, like if you're not familiar with threat model, like, you know, like you should be like for whatever product that you're designing, thinking on the threat model, you know, things that are exposed on that device and just, you know, like try to reduce the most you can. Like for example, you art, you know, like maybe you need it, but maybe, you know, like you don't, then you can easily remove like JTAG, for example, is a big issue, right? If you, if you don't block that, like people can easily extract things that, you know, like on memory that are on the running system. Uh, and just like one minor thing is like, for example, maybe on the application, you have the OS, right? But let's suppose, you know, like you're thinking now about the application, uh, you know, like uh, one, you know, like thing that's coming, like a common thing these days is to try to content, uh, contain the application, for example, in a container. I mean, there are several, you know, like different methods of doing that. And uh, Sergio Prat is doing a presentation covering like security aspects on a, on a, on the container. So um, it's something that if you guys want to have a look at, suggest go in there on Friday. And uh, even then now, you know, like just talking about HSM, even with, you know, like dealing with that HSM, you need to know and, and be aware of some good practices as well. Like, as I said, you know, like hopefully the key's not, you know, like you're not gonna be able to extract the key, um, you know, like by, even by having, you know, like physical access to the hardware. Uh, but, you know, like there are things that you should be aware of. Like, for example, how do you do the communication with the element? Are you encrypting the communication? You know, like, so there's, there's actually a protocol uh, called like the, the secure channel protocol tree in which you use to start to establish the communication with the secure element and you can encrypt that communication. And of course, there's the key that you use for doing that encryption, but I'll get that in, in a bit, how, uh, in a bit uh, how to better handle that. Uh, the other thing as well, you know, like reducing access to the element. So like you don't need to have it, you know, like uh, uh, give access to, you know, like all users on your system. You can reduce like through permissions for groups or even through abstractions. Like, for example, as Annie was saying, you know, like uh, the PKSS11 implementation, you know, like the library, you can use that. Uh, you can use, for example, this is another project that ARM is pushing for uh, quite a bit lately is called Parsec, the Platform of Abstraction for Security. And the idea is to have some sort of like a service in which the service control access to, this, to the secure elements, like TPM as well. And then, you know, like you know, your application only have to deal with the service. So you can have like multiple containers talking, you know, like through that service without having direct access to the element. And that service is the one responsible for abstracting the assets. And then you can have policies and so on and so forth. Uh, and the other thing as well, you know, like especially on ARM SOCs, you have the trusted execution environment in which you can run the secure OS. So that's another kind of good abstractions that you can do is just have the secure OS take control of the, the HSM. And going a bit further into that, like um, something, you know, like just to cover some of the work that we decided to do. We had like some customers that were really looking forward on using like the NXP secure element, call it SO50. Uh, there's 51 now, which is YDX. Uh, and we decided to uh, have the implementation in a way that you could abstract the access to the element by, uh, you know, by using and leveraging the, the trust zone technology. So that's something that we did, uh, you know, we worked with upstream is adding support in Opti to have actually, you know, like to manipulate and, and take control uh, of the element. So you would basically boot the system and then the Opti, which is the secure OS, would initialize with, you know, like communication with the element and then all the, the rest of the, the stack gets, you know, like when it needs to communicate with the element, it needs to go through uh, Opti. So you, you add a new level of protection. 
The good thing about that, you can extend the harder root of trust uh, you, because when you perform, for example, secure boot and opt OS is one of the elements, you know, it's one of the, you know, like the binaries and the OSs that you start on the early boot, so you can extend that as well. Uh, the encryption, as I was saying, like to the element, uh, if you're leveraging, for example, the opt and it is an implementation that we did, uh, you know, like even if you want to encrypt the communication with the element, you need to store that key somewhere. So, uh, you know, like by using opt, there's a nice functionality in which, like, if the hardware provides a way to generate a hardware unique key at runtime, you can automatically derive a key from that key and then use that key that you derived for doing the, the, the actual encryption. And this is nice because then you bind the element to the SOC. So if you remove the element, replace the element, uh, the hardware unique key is going to defer. Uh, you're not going to match with the element, and same thing, you know, like with the SOC. If you just try to replace it for, you know, like for abusing it, uh, it's not going to work because it's, it's just like dynamically uh, uh, derived from the hardware unique key. Uh, and uh, the also, you know, like great thing that we did, which uh, is you know, like we also help it a bit, like on the PHS and implementation in Opti, and then because we are in like we have this integration done in Opti, and Opti itself has a trusted library and that has a library and a trusted application for PKSS11. You can simply just use that library to you know like and underneath Opti is going to use the element, but you don't need to know about that, and so it's transparent for, to the application. And then uh, the PDF is on the schedule, so in case you want to have a look as well, like we uh, uh, Jorge uh, who uh, Ramirez who worked with us as well, like he. He did a presentation a couple of weeks ago in Embedded Recipes, uh, just talking a bit how the implementation was done, how the integration was done. So I would suggest you to have a look at that if you're interested on the topic. And also, like for any, you know, like like for any of these bulleted items here, like we could do a presentation in its own. So if you have any question in particular, if you want to look how we did, uh, you know, like uh, on our OS and so on and so forth, which is all open source, we can you know like get the details. We're happy to provide details there. Then I'm giving back to Andy. There we go. Um, so yeah, let me. NXP has a, as Ricardo was saying, they've got a pretty cool product called the SEO uh, 50, now the 51. You can put that on an embedded product right now and it works. Um, they also kind of, they also have a, a really neat product that's called edgelock to go and this is kind of a, a software as a service, I guess, offering that they have in the cloud that uh, helps you manage keys. So. You know, the thing with PKI is how you're going to distribute all these keys and stuff. And edgelock to go is this cloud service they have where you can start to delegate different things to it, and it will create intermediate CAs. You can sign them yourself if you want to own that route, but then they have intermediate uh, certificate authorities that can start creating uh, certificates and hand them out to all the devices in your fleet that have these SEO 50s. So, you kind of, instead of building out your own like PKI distribution like piece of software, you could like <laughs> leverage Edge like to go if you'd like. Um, and then like for me, I was dealing with someone earlier. I, I'm trying to work my way up into the cloud, not have to get into the weeds and solder stuff anymore. So um, SoftHSM is a project you can use on any device, and it acts like an HSM, but it's just pure software. So it's a great way to prototype stuff. It, you're trying to make sure that, like, you know, theoretically things are going to work according to your assumptions. Um, and sometimes people ask, well, what about my RPI? And this is just kind of my snarky. You can have an RPI or you can be secure. You got to pick one, though. It's not going to, it's not going to work for you. So now we're kind of getting to, to the end of uh, some summarizing things. Um, there's some things that we can start doing to be secure with our devices. So use mutual TLS. Um, and once you have mutual TLS sorted out for your fleet, you can keep those keys in your uh, secure element. Um, and now that we know your device's public key, we can start giving it like configuration data, however you want to manage that for your fleet. You can encrypt that asymmetrically in a really nice way. Um, if you're using third-party systems, like I was saying earlier, the good ones all support mutual TLS hooks for doing whatever you want. Um, 
And then, is like Ricardo was kind of talking about earlier, like we can start building our, our uh, software trust from the hardware root of trust and uh, work our way up. Um, so we go through all layers of the operating system as we're working on this. And things we can uh, stop doing. So let's stop putting stuff in clear text on devices. There's ways that you can prevent that. So we have to look at that more seriously. Um, in particular, Amazon, and I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of AWS. I, I kind of joke that they're the cloud C++. And I mean that in all the bad ways of C++, but also all the good ways of C++. It's some really uh, powerful stuff. But Amazon has their AWS IoT project, which is a pretty cool thing. And they have this uh, uh, process called just-in-time provisioning, where using TLS, you can have devices just automatically connect into AWS IoT and start being managed there. Um, it's a little tricky to do. Um, I, I'm at the risk of uh, mixing metaphors. Um, their identity and access management system, AIM, in, um, in AWS is kind of their version of SC Linux. And it's really hard. It takes great restraint not to just disable SC Linux and do the right thing. But if you work through it all, and I actually I had a lot of trouble figuring this out when I was trying to do a blog. So I, if you want to follow my blog there, if you ever get interested in AWS IoT, it kind of walks you through how to do it. And it's all command lines that you can copy and paste. Because the problem with AWS is their tutorials, especially anything with IAM, it's click this, click this, click this in a UI. And you never remember how you got there at the end. Um, now, if not AWS, like I say, an MTLS is supported by all the, all the big players. And what I would do, now that I'm telling you to stop putting these credentials on a device, is uh, my more generic advice is set up what they'll have, wherever you, whatever your cloud provider is, they're going to have some API gateway. Set up MTLS on that. And then they're going to have, you know, if you want to be one of the cool kids, let's do a serverless Lambda function where you can start accepting traffic from your devices. It'll, maybe they'll say, hey, can you give me the uh, temporary credentials to, to talk to this service? And that Lambda function can now give like, you know, here's a credential, it's good for two minutes, and then it goes away. So that's how I would start trying to think about like talking to cloud services in a safe way. And then Ricardo kind of added this toward the end of our thing is like, we got to stop thinking of security as an afterthought. Like, you've got to do this early on in the project. You can't bolt it on at the end. So um, that's everything that we had. Um, if you've got questions. Yeah, I've got one. Um, it's more about strategies. So at my old company, they had this, you're starting to prototype this methodology called key rolling. Um, okay. If you want to ask a question, I can repeat it. Yeah. Um, so, and so like, There you okay. go. Okay. Yep. Um, so the concept behind like key rolling would be like you may remote at a state early in the root of trust, or maybe for a device that has minimal or no network connectivity, maybe it has only one hardware root of trust, and then each, and then you subdivide the system into very small modules, and each one contains the key that attestates the next one, and they're never the same, right? Like maybe you're using one style for this, and like right. Is that a waste of time, in your opinion? Or because it's a lot of overhead, it's a lot of work. But is the payoff there for all of that work? Yeah, it's you may have to get out. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I might need to go into here. So I, th I think so. Like I mean, like the the thing is 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 like as Lynn has even said, and I quoted in there is like, it's. You add a bunch of layers, uh, like uh, of course, like it complicates development as well. It's annoying. You have to handle with a bunch of things and so on and so forth. But I believe it pays off in the end because you have like so many different layers in, in, in like either abstractions and so on. E even if you have like probably with one of them, you can still you know like be kind of you know like conscious that you know, like nothing necessarily bad is going to happen, right? But of course, like it's a pain. So yeah, but I think it's still worth it. You know? You know, when we were creating our company, one thing that we kind of did
did early on was um, we kind of took this mentality of things are hard, let's just do it more often. <laughs> and I think that's one of those things like you, you will, it'll get easier if you just force yourself to do it. And we did a lot of hard things that were painful, but it's kind of paid off for us. One, one thing, for example, as we did, like, um, you know, like as we suggest to customers, like, for example, even for secure boot, right, you have to fuse and so on and so forth. But even at the beginning of the development, what we suggest them is just create a development key, just fuse and play with it, get comfortable, you know, and then later on, you just swap the keys. You don't need to redo anything, and you're more comfortable with the stack as you go as well. Any other questions? No problem. I was just curious, when you talk about disk encryption, are you thinking full system disk encryption or just focused on the like data partition, kind of the modifiable properties? So that usually depends on if you don't need to hide anything, you don't have like proprietary, for example, information in the root file system, what we suggest is just not encrypted necessarily. If it's just you know like open source content and so on, but most of the companies they are you know like concerned about uh, leaking even what they are actually using. So um, usually you know like what I see is that people want to prefer go like full encryption for everything, not only the you know like the system, uh, but for the data as well. Of course, like there's there's penalties in performance if for doing that. Uh, some devices offer like for example NXP offers with the CAM, you can do like crypto accelerations and you can use that acceleration for you know, like disk encryption as well to facilitate some of that. But then it's, it's, it's depends on the, the kind of customers that you know, like they would have. But my you know, like initial thinking on this is that as long as you don't need to protect the IP, it's, you shouldn't necessarily be encrypting, right? It just creates another layer of complication in a way. But at least like, well, of course, like for private data and so on, then you, then you encrypt. A short one. Uh, what are your thoughts about secure JTAG? You mentioned that disabling JTAG, of course, is one thing that we should be doing. But um, I think that a lot of vendors, a lot of SOC vendors today offer some kind of secure JTAG functionality. Mike, did you ever play it with secure JTAG? It's a good feature. Yeah. Secure JTAG is great uh, if you can afford it. It can be fairly expensive if you, um, I don't know if you've ever looked into licensing of those units and how you use them in production, but um, if you can afford it, use it. It's always, it's another layer, right? You have another layer of protection. If that, if you don't want to disable that, if you want to be able to recover the devices uh, in the field, then you can leave it enabled and you have keys to protect the JTAG access. But uh, oftentimes it can be kind of prohibitive. And what you'll see is companies will only use them at the very, very beginning of their product development, and then they very quickly move away to something else. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a lot with using the elliptical curve uh, as part of the encryption, and every now and then I get uh, flow down from the bosses of, well, how do we start protecting against quantum computers? And I know NIST has a working project of trying to find the right algorithms, but uh, is there a general timeline that you all have seen of when people have to start migrating from elliptical, elliptical curve to the next algorithm? I'm not up to date on that stuff. I, I tend to just go with, you know, what they're saying now, and yeah. So we do ED25519 is like the kind of the curve people use, but. Yeah, usually, at least like what we see is that, uh, at least like with the customers that we have, they, of course, they don't want to protect the, the, the product and AP and so on, but they're not that paranoid at this point of like, because they're thinking, of course, like a product like five to 20 years lifetime. And uh, in the hope of, of course, like we, we create something that, you know, like it's able to later on uh, to resist to that kind of, you know, like attack. But which is why like one other thing, you know, like as I put it, put it in the afterthought in there that you should start doing, is like allowing the system to be updatable, um, like from not only the OS and the application, but the whole thing, right, as well. Like even some, like for example, the, the NXP HSM, there's I think like a Java-based OS that you can even update the OS itself inside the element. So hopefully, you know, like if you have the possibility of, you know, like updating the system at any point in time, then once there's a solution, you can try to roll it out. And then of course, like create new certificates, new keys, enroll, all of that, so. Uh, 
I think we're out of time now. Can we take one more question? One more question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, yeah. um, could you please explain why you decide to go with uh, Opti instead of Trusty? This is first. And uh, the libraries you use with Opti, I guess you are embedded as right? Or something else you, do, you use? Your so we did uh, Opti mostly because like we, we came from Lanaro and then like when we were looking at um, you know, like the more kind of generic um, you know, like OS for um, for Linux in general, uh, you know, like that was kind of the OS to go. Uh, so we decided to stay with that. Of course, I think I don't remember if there's people even using on Android these days. But uh, so it's more kind of you know like the at least the one that we have familiar familiarity. We contributed before, so we, and it seems to be coming. You know, like a, at least like for SLC such as NXP and Xilinx and even TI now, like they're all supporting Opti officially. So. Uh, we decided to go that way. And now for the library, uh, like for example, uh, what we what we use, like you know, like we, even with Opti, there's a, a PSS11 based library that matches the trusted application. And then we just use, for example, the OpenSSL like PSS11 engine, and then it just goes through there. So we don't we don't necessarily have to do like a specific TLS implementation or embedded TLS or so on. We can just simply use it in the OpenSSL engine, for example. All right, thanks a lot, everyone.